Yeah, so multiplayer enterprise applications. There's some words that kind of, when you put them together in a sentence, you kind of, what? Like bicycle and fish or enterprise application and multiplayer. So let's first have a look at what I mean with, with, with those things. So when we talk about enterprise applications, uh, I'm talking about applications that aren't really built for the user, but they are built for the organization that employs that user. Maybe it's kind of, kind of your job, maybe it's some kind of voluntary things or something, but still kind of, it's the organization that is the point of that application, it's not the user itself. The thing with this is that it's, based on my experience, it's a silent majority of all software development that happens. You don't see very much about it, because, I mean, that's not what, what the big tech companies are, are talking about. But just kind of raise your hand if you work on that kind of software. So I'm seeing, yeah, roughly half of the room. So, yeah, just as expected. So d just to kind of point out that this is, it's very common. One interesting thing with these is that they are a little bit behind. Talking, for instance, about NoSQL or Kubernetes or those kinds of things. They started in the, again, kind of big tech companies, uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, you know them all. And, and then kind of gradually these same things, they have kind of trickled down to also be part of enterprise application development. But there's a couple of years of delay usually before something, something really goes, goes kind of mainstream enterprise development. Then multiplayer. So I think there's three kind of waves of multiplayer stuff going on in software development. First, we had many, many, many years ago, we got two, two, two kind of things. We got gaming and we got just kind of instant messaging with IRC being the kind of one old example there. And well, that was definitely kind of multiple players and so on. Then we got the second phase which was kind of Google Docs, Figma is something that lots of designers are familiar with. Basically, you, you work together, definitely. Uh, it's not kind of a game, but you work together. It's not really still enterprise software, since these are applications kind of built for consumers. They are used in enterprises, but they're still not kind of customized for the enterprises, so to say. Because what, what's happening now, thanks to, for instance, pandemic, thanks to some technology kind of catching on and so on. We're now getting to the third wave when you will be building applications where multiple people are kind of interacting in, in real time. And, well, who am I to make these claims? Well, as you already heard, my name is Leif. I am VP of R&D at a place called Vaadin. Mm. We've been for 20 years now building open source frameworks for building enterprise web applications. So uh, our most popular or famous thing is uh, called uh, Vaadin Flow. Uh, it lets you build applications using only Java on the server and nothing else. So you got kind of a vertical layout class that has a text field and a button, and then you add a click listener to it and then kind of show notifications. And all of that runs on the server, which is great for many enterprise applications. If that's not your thing, if you think kind of, oh, we should have modern front end with React or Angular or something. We also got another framework called Hilla, which is about connecting those front ends into a Java backend with kind of generating TypeScript definitions and so on. If you're interested about that, go visit our booth uh, upstairs. Uh, I'm not here to talk with you, uh, talk about that with you today. Instead, I'm here to talk about the multiplayer things because r related to our kind of main frameworks, we have also been building something we call the collaboration kit, which is all about building these kinds of collaborative things into the business applications. And I'm really kind of sharing my experiences here, helping you understand what you will be needing soon when you also will get those kinds of, of wishes from your product managers or whoever decides what you're working on. So what we're going to talk about is first, Look at the use cases, kind of what does these kind of things look like from the user's point of view? What, what, what's there in the actual applications that they see? 
Then, since we are developers after all, wh what kind of architecture do you need? How do you structure your, your data? How do you structure your, your kind of messages going back and forth in a way that makes it easy to build these kinds of things? And then finally, someone will always ask that one question, but does it scale? So finally, also talking about how these things can be applied in a cluster, because maybe you probably you don't need to kind of go cluster just because of these multiplayer things. But the thing is that when you have a cluster with multiple servers and so on, then having those talking to each other in a way that makes sense becomes a little bit more interested, so, uh, interesting. So that's why I will also be talking about that. So, starting with the use cases. Maybe kind of user story format is familiar for you. As a multiplayer enterprise application, I want to be multiplayer so that uh, enterprise. Uh, well, not really. What it really means in this kind of business application, enterprise application context, it's really people working together. We got colleagues maybe working on, on whatever they're working on, or maybe we got suppliers and, and providers, kind of customers and so on, organizing something. And, and that's, that's kind of, that's the core of collaboration, core of multiplayer stuff in business applications. This is quite in contrast with what you have on, so to say, the consumer side, because there you have kind of mass events, you got thousands, 10,000, 100,000 persons watching a moon rocket blow up or something like that. And when that happens, everyone writes, whoa, in the chat and kind of messages fly by so quickly so that you can't even see what it says. That's not meaningful in a business context. It's cool, interesting, yes, but to kind of, to make something useful in this context, you need to remember You've got a couple, you've got a team collaborating. You might have 500 teams maybe, but still each individual kind of collaboration. It's just a couple of colleagues, people who know each other or, or who, who kind of share the same interests. They want to, to make, make an order or whatever. They are working together to make something happen. The thing also with, with business applications is they almost always cruds. Basically, load something from the database, filter it, view it, edit it, remove it, and that's basically it. Sometimes it's very well disguised, sometimes it's kind of, you just have the list of entries in a form. Uh, so, we're going to look at a couple of uh, user examples here. We got two different users, we got Marge and we got Homer who are then collaborating on this CRUD application when they are sharing experiences on different uh, developer conferences and so on that they have been, been going to. So here they, here they are both looking at the JFocus entry and kind of see that, oh, well, apparently someone entered the, w what they like about this thing and, and they think that, no, it should be edited. And the thing is, they don't know about each other. They sit in different offices or something. Each of them individually opens clicks the edit button, gets an edit form. Then each of them kind of makes their own edits to this uh, record. Uh, then Marge is the first one to save. And then Homer, well, he, he does what he does. Then eventually he also remembers, that, oh, right, I should click that button also. And now what happened? Now they see different things on their screens. W what's actually kind of the, 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 what's the truth here now? Because here they caused a conflict between independent changes that they did. But the problem is that they're not aware of it. Probably the way this is implemented is kind of last right wins, which means that now it's Homer's edit that is there and, and what Marge did, it, that's just lost. So one easy way of fixing or fixing this is that you just use Hibernate or something, you just add optimistic locking, and then this is what happens instead. So, uh, well, now Homer at least realizes that, oh, there's a problem here, needs to do something about it. But what can he do? Not so much. So what you end up doing then is to make it so that if someone else has edited, 
Then when you save, you get kind of this merge dialog or something where you can see that, oh, well, these things have also changed at the same time. And then the, the poor person needs to figure out kind of what, what to make out of that. So that's kind of, that's doable. That's still not really multiplayer, I would say, because it's, it's not in real time. So what can we do instead here? One thing we can do to kind of improve this uh, user experience is to use locking. So what if, same situation, they both look at this thing, they both had ed edit buttons, but the moment one of them clicks the edit button, it gets disabled for everyone else who looks at the same screen or, or kind of for the same data also, because of course you can edit another conference at the same time. Not only that, you can also see who, who kind of, who is the one who is editing. That person then, they edit, and immediately when they save, the edit button is again available, and you also immediately see what the changes were. You don't need to kind of refresh to, to see what's the updated value, but you can Im immediately see that. So this is again kind of, it's getting better, maybe still not optimal, because you had a problem that what if while Homer was editing that, he was kind of slow getting distracted, doing something else. And during that time, Marge can't do anything. So that's a little bit frustrating. One thing we can do about that is to also add, because what Marge might be doing then is to go to Teams or Slack and scream and say, hey, stop editing that thing. I want to also do some things on it. But uh, what if instead you can, in the application, have a kind of for each business record you have, you also have a chat. So there's kind of a message box there that anyone who has this entity open can, view, uh, can type something in. So Marge can kind of say that, hey, could you please also, while you're editing, can you also make this small thing that I would want to have there so I don't need to wait for you? And, and then Homer can kind of type back that, yeah, sure, fine. A and then based on that, Homer can make his, his edits. And, and in that way, you kind of, they are actively collaborating now and, and that kind of, uh, I mean, it, it feels good, but it's also more productive in that way. Another variation, because I mean, this, it's an improvement because you don't need to go to, to, to Slack to actually kind of send that message. It's kind of in context, you have it in front of you all the time. But still, what if, what if Homer is, uh, actually, what if Marge wants to do a bigger thing, doesn't want to bother him, but just wants to kind of wait until it's her turn. So maybe we could also have a checkbox kind of notify me when, when it's no longer locked so, so I can do my things. So we can check that button and then go on looking at other parts of the application. So browsing around and, and doing whatever you do, do, doing some other work basically. And then once that thing is no longer locked, you can get a no notification saying that kind of, now, now, now you can continue there again and with a nice link so you immediately go there and so on. So in this way, Things are quite good. We got one small problem still, which is what if the other person goes for lunch while having that thing locked? What if they get run over by a bus on the way to lunch? Kind of, you need some way of being able to still unlock the things that people have forgotten or whatever. So there's a little bit of extra kind of extra things you need here. It's not really that easy, but close enough at least. But really, there's, there's one way that, that we can take it even further, and that's borrowing ideas from, from Google Docs in, in, again, where you can kind of actually live editing the thing together. So again, the same situation, Homer already started editing, Marge also see that, well, I also want to do some stuff. And here also the edit button is not disabled. We, we haven't locked others out, but instead both can edit the same draft together uh, they see who else is editing there because there's icons in each kind of upper right corner of, of what they're doing. When one per person focuses a field, then the other one sees that, okay, now, now someone is in that field. So uh, uh, th this is actually, this is one difference. In Google Docs, for instance, what you have is kind of one big text field, so to say, and everyone editing that at, at the same time. But when you have kind of a business application with forms, you got structured data and so on. And usually it doesn't make sense to have multiple persons in the same text field because it's just kind of so crowded. Uh, but instead, these kind of social signals seeing that, hey, okay, I should stay away because 
I can edit the other fields wh while, while the other person edit, edits that field. So in that way, you just see who's there and, and that's kind of, because humans, they want to cooperate, that, that works just as well and it's easier to deal with in, in many ways. Continuing the example, also kind of, this is a shared draft, so immediately one, when one person edits something, the other can also see on their own screen what, what, what the new values are. There's one more gotcha here. Uh, this is again, this is a business application, which typically means that when you save something, some other things also happen. You got some triggers, you're sending out emails, changing, changing some statuses here and there and so on. And the problem here is that when you're editing the same draft at the same time, what if someone else happens to make an incomplete edit just at the moment when you hit save? So what you really want to have here is preview button. So when you, when you click that one, you get a snapshot of what the data was at that point, and then you can save that snapshot if you have seen that, yeah, okay, we don't have anything incomplete here. If you see that, well, there's a mess here, then you can kind of go back to editing. Uh, but if this is fine, then you can save this exact version that you see there, and in that way you avoid that problem. When we look, kind of take all these together, extract the, the reusable parts, we got a couple of kind of very simple UI concepts that take you very far in this context. So we got just seeing presence, who is also do kind of in the same place, so to say, in the application. We got locking, we got notifications to see what's up, we got messaging to communicate directly with each other, and then we got the the kind of editing things together. And just by combining those in different ways, you can build lots of different uh, application experiences. So those were the use cases. Mm, one final thing to point out here is that this is a little bit like security. You can't just kind of paste it on at the end of the project. This is something that you need to take into account already when designing the UX, because otherwise you have, well, it's not easy to take an existing UI design and just kind of, oh, let's make it collaborative, let's make it secure, let's make it performant. No, that's not the way it works. But still, give those building blocks to a UI designer and, and you get some, can get some really good stuff out of that. So then we come to how do we implement this? I'm not gonna show you the code, but I'm gonna talk about kind of architectural concepts. How do you think about these kinds of things? Um, and, and the really core thing we have here is that we got UI state that is shared between all these users looking at the same thing. So if, if you're using um, a front-end framework, like for instance, React or Angular, they, they make it really kind of explicit that this is the state of a view. And, and the thing that, that kind of, the only thing that is different here is that parts of that state is shared between multiple users. And the only trick is to kind of, how do we synchronize that UI state? Because I mean, we got a UI framework already that when the state changes, it updates what's shown on the UI. We only need to actually apply those state changes. Another thing to notice here is that, yes, this is UI state. It doesn't need, or it shouldn't go all the way to the database. It doesn't need to touch any backend system. It doesn't go, go through 10 layers of microservices. It's just UI state. You'd keep it, maybe kind of in the front end, maybe on the server, because, well, that depends on, on lots of other things, but it's, it's really kind of, it's only that layer of the application, which means that you avoid lots of performance issues, for instance. Uh, the other thing also to remember again, like I've been saying a couple of times, I will say it again. We're talking about relatively small kind of in the individual collaboration se sessions. You might have many of them, but each one is isolated. So uh, it, that way also helps with all kinds of performance issues you have. So the trick really is to isolate those things so that you don't have contention, you don't have kind of lots of different things affecting the same, or kind of want, wanting to write to the same state, but instead isolate them. So in a chat example, you got kind of each channel in the chat is isolated from each other. What I type in, in the announcement channel, it doesn't affect anyone who is looking at the random channel. But still, making things interested, 
we are uh, engineers, we have learned to kind of SQL data normalization and so on. Don't do that with the UI state. It's completely fine to, to duplicate things if that helps you structure things in a more sensible way. So for instance, here we got the channels list where you just see kind of bolded the channels where you have unread messages. So one way of thinking of this is that kind of each channel is its, is its own context. And then that channel list for that you have kind of one shared UI state where you just have the last updated timestamp for all the channels. So then it's kind of just small updates whenever something happens, but then the person actually seeing the messages, that's then bigger updates that need to happen and, and kind of splitting things up in that way helps you, uh, uh, help you avoid that contention. Mm. Related to this also, this maps really well to the UI. You can usually see that kind of each of these collaboration contexts is kind of a different component in the UI. So the sidebar is one component and the, the kind of actual list of messages, that's a different component and, and kind of each component has its own shared, shared state. We have chosen, that's up to you to use whatever terminology, but for us we talk about these kind of context isolated things as topics. So it's not the same as a topic in JMS, it's not the same as a topic in Kafka, but they are still kind of similar enough to, to, to kind of reuse that terminology. Next architectural concept, consistency. So there's two different approaches here and you will probably scratch your head a little bit and wonder which way would make most sense. Because you got either, you have to choose either use eventual consistency or then you use strong consistency. So the difference between these, eventual consistency, that's kind of decentralized clusters, peer-to-peer um, -peer kind of things and so on. Whereas strong consistency, that's always based on having some kind of centralized thing, some kind of authoritative source saying that this is the actual truth and nothing else is, is kind of real. Technology-wise, uh, eventual consistency, that's usually some kind of CRDT uh, conflict-free replicated data type. Uh, go and look at the Wikipedia page if you want to know more. Uh, it's interesting stuff, but complicated. Uh, strong consistency, that's nowadays uh, usually event sourcing. So again, I mentioned Kafka already, and that's, that's a good example of, of that kind of, that kind of concept. Uh, very, very quickly about CRDTs. So one example, the point with CRDTs is to avoid conflicts. You need to structure data in a way that no matter what happens, you can't have a conflict. So for instance, with a counter, what you can have is that each party keeps track of what's the kind of biggest counter value you have seen from everyone else. So Marge has counted to three and last she knew, Homer had counted to four. So from her point of view, the value of that counter is seven. Homer on the other hand, when he last talked with Marge, she had one on the counter, but Homer has, has gone to five. So from his point of view, the value is six. But the thing here is that these two views can be merged again without conflicts. So if they sync up again, they will see that, well, obviously the actual value here is three plus five, so eight. So in that way, that's kind of the most simple CRDT you have. The point here, the things, thing that makes things challenging is that with eventual consistency, you can never be certain about anything. Because the whole point is that it's fine if you get updates out of sync and kind of you just deal with that by saying that the data structure so that there's not problem with being out of sync. This leads to a problem because if you, for instance, want to do locking, you just can't do that. The best thing you can do is to say that I assume that I have the lock, I do these operations based on that assumption. If my assumption that I had the lock is invalidated because receiving a kind of conflicting but not conflicting message, basically a late kind of delayed message from someone else, then all the other operations you did also need to be invalidated because, well, it turns out you didn't have the lock. So that's complicated stuff. We don't want to do that. Instead, go with strong consistency for the UI logic because then 
yes, you need to wait for kind of getting acknowledgement, being certain that yes, now we have this centralized server saying that yes, I do, I actually have acquired the lock. But then after that, you don't need to worry anymore. And, and that's really, really useful for humans to understand what goes on. So we got it, this shared state between the users. We got strong consistency for updating it. What does the actual state look like? Mm. It can very well be uh, represented as kind of a JSON-like structure. So we just get kind of lists and maps of, of really simple primitive values. And all the use cases I showed can be represented in that way. So a lock, that's just a list of, of entries. The first one is the one that holds the lock and everyone all the following ones are just waiting to, to acquire it next and next and next. Presence information, that's also just a list, but now it's instead you, you kind of view that as a set of all the persons who are present. Notifications, that's a list of objects describing those notifications. Messages, that's again just a list of message objects. Editing, that's a map of kind of what's the current value of each field and maybe then also kind of another map with who is who has this field focus right now to be able to show the highlights. One thing to also notice here is that you can put all of these into the same state. So for instance, when we had the editing graph together example, we had kind of the actual editing and we had presence with, uh, with the avatars in the same context. So they belong then in the same topic also because everyone who looks at one of those also looks at the other at the same time. How do you update this state then? Well, I kind of talked about event sourcing already and that continues here. So individual comments saying that, well, now something happened, for instance, with this lock, to acquire, try to acquire the lock, you insert yourself as the last entry in the list. And then we see that, well, after that, in the bottom, the state is that, well, now the list looks like this. And then we got another party also trying to get the lock, inserting themselves as the last one, and then the first uh, Homer, when he's done, he's kind of removing himself from the, lock, uh, from the list, and that leads to kind of the state being that Marge is the only one in the list. A couple of things to notice here is that each of these kinds of update objects, they also directly map to a change in the UI. So for instance, when the first message comes, what ch changes in Marge's UI is that suddenly the edit button is disabled. And correspondingly, Home Homer sees that, well, now I actually have it locked. And kind of each of those things, whenever you get one of these, typically something in the UI also changes. And that's kind of, uh, that makes things easier to, to kind of map between state changes and UI changes. One thing to also notice here is that uh, in this example, the actual operations, it's kind of insert last, remove first. Uh, they are designed to not have conflicts in that way. So if two persons insert last at the same time, that's fine. If you would do index based, two persons saying in, insert at index zero, then that would be, well, actually that still works. But for instance, with removals, you, you will have problems if you don't have, have these kind of relative uh, references to what, what should be done. More complex cases, you can also have kind of insert between these entries and so on. Building with this kind of structure, as long as you don't have a structure, this is really, really easy. It's just a static variable with, with this data. Lock around it to, for the update to, to, to kind of avoid, avoid corrupting the data and you're done. We're going to look at clustering in a while, but, but kind of uh, this is really simple. Uh, without a cluster. Last thing I want to talk about from the kind of simple in-memory uh, architecture is how you subscribe to, to, to changes. So what you would spontaneously do, you've got a topic, you want to subscribe to it, you give a callback that kind of whenever you get, we get a new event, we update whatever should be updated in the UI based on this. The problem here, of course, is that we also need to take the initial state into account because otherwise we, well, <laughs> it wouldn't just show, show the right thing. So the kind of straightforward way of doing that is to split it into two. You first get the initial state from the topic, you use that to initialize the UI, and then you 
subscribe with a callback to do the actual up, uh, kind of incremental updates. But this got two problems. First problem is that now you probably duplicate some code between your initialize UI and your update UI functions. The other problem, which is probably even worse, is that if you do it in this way, if something happens between the initialization and the subscription, then you miss those events. So that's not nice. You can kind of cheat with that by switching the order. First you subscribe and then you initialize. Then you need to kind of avoid duplicates instead and, and so on. That's doable, but extract that into a kind of framework function. So what you actually do from your application logic is that you initialize and subscribe in one go. So have the system generate synthetic events based on the initial state. Doesn't need to have all, all the history, but only kind of what's needed to recreate what the UI state is right now. Each of those go to the update UI callback. And then after that, you start getting live updates. So this is again, straight from the event sourcing kind of handbook, but it's, it's also a really useful, uh, uh, really useful concept here. Mm, I will let you take a picture and then I will continue. There we go. So that was the architecture. We got things isolated into topics. There are, each one is kind of mapped to a separate component in the UI. People kind of, people who work together use the same topic, but they're isolated from each other. Inside those, you got shared UI state for that particular item that's, that's being edited or looked at, at or whatever. You got strong cons consistency for updating because otherwise things like locking would be really impossible to do in a sensible way. And we got event, sor event sourcing principles with kind of incremental updates uh, to, to update that state. And then finally, we got those synthetic events to, to deal with the subscription kind of uh, ordering issue. So now we only got the clustering. Here, like I said, the assumption is that just because you add multiplayer functionality to your application, that doesn't mean that suddenly you need clustering. It's quite the opposite. I'm assuming that if you already have clustering for other reasons, maybe high availability, maybe to be flexible with capacity, maybe just for kind of load balancing overall, then you probably already have some infrastructure set up around that. And you also want that to work with, with these uh, collaborative things. So what about that? Well, it turns out you will end up building a distributed system. And one thing I learned in school is that building distributed systems, that's kind of complicated. So you don't want to do that. What you really want to do is you want to reuse some existing technology for the distributed system part. And, and the good thing is that this synchronizing UI state, it doesn't require much from that system. So we of course need to be able to distribute changes between nodes in the cluster. We want to have strong consistency again, because, well, obviously, the, otherwise the locking and such and wouldn't work. And preferably also exactly once delivery, because, well, we can work around that, but it's so much easier if you get it, and, and most systems actually make it quite easy to have that. So what we have realized is that, well, this list, that's a description of Kafka, for instance. It's a description of uh, in-memory data grids like uh, InfiniSpen or Hazelcast. It's a description of any actor system. So for instance, Akka is the most known example there. It's, if you stretch it a little bit, it's an example of any distributed cache because you can build the event log basically as a linked list of entries there because all of those have kind of uh, conditional inserts. So you can, you can make changes only if if something else hasn't happened and so on. What you can't do is just use JMS for this because JMS doesn't keep track of old messages. So instead you would kind of need to have a SQL database for the message history and JMS for sending out notification that, hey, now there's something new in the database, go fetch it. That's not really optimal. It works in small scale, but I wouldn't maybe recommend that for 
for a bigger, bigger application. But it's still do doable. When we get to this clustering still, I mean, yes, we get lots of things for free by integrating with, for instance, Kafka. But there's some things to take into account. Actually, specifically about Kafka, one thing to mention is that there the kind of topic is a slightly different thing. What you only need there, you can put all the collaborative stuff in one topic and then you do use a unique, unique partition key for each kind of collaborative topic because that's what Kafka uses to kind of direct the messages to different nodes in the Kafka cluster and then everything that goes to the same node is guaranteed to be processed in order. But still, uh, we need to deal with, with conflicts because what happens in the cluster is that you have latency. You, you, you can't have immediate updates for everything. So what happens, for instance, if both Marge and Homer want to acquire the same lock at the same time. So what happens is that they both send a message saying that, hey, insert me as the last one is the, in this list that I assume to be empty. And they go to, to this kind of whatever system you use. We call that a synchronizer, just to kind of not need to talk about Kafka or Infinite Span or, or, or. But it goes to the synchronizer. The synchronizer is the one who kind of decides who was first and publishes the official event log in, in the order that things actually are. So in this case, Homer happened to be the one whose message was first processed by the synchronizer. And then everyone who subscribes to this event log will see that, well, first we had an insert last message from Homer and then one from Marge. And then based on that, everyone know what's up. They know that now it's Homer who has this, this log. The other thing that you will get again, familiar if you're already into event sourcing, is that this event log, it will grow just longer and longer and longer over time, which means that it will eventually become slow to replay it to get to the what's the current UI state. So to deal with that, you also need to do snapshots. So what that means is, uh, for instance, once every 100 or 10 or 1,000, depends on, on on your performance tuning, but every now and then regular intervals, whoever submits that message in the order is also responsible for updating a snapshot of the, of the current UI. So this is why you probably want to have this logic on the server so that you kind of, for security reasons basically, otherwise this could just as well be, be only in the, in the client. But for this kind of getting those snapshots there without having to build logic into the synchronous or logic into Kafka or whatever. So that's, that's why, why you need this thing. So the way that works then is that kind of the snapshot based on these three first messages. It would be an object saying that this is the actual state. We got, well, Marge in the lock list and that's all. And this is now, this snapshot is based on event number three in the log. So then when, when a new node joins the cluster, they can load the latest snapshot, get the initial UI state from there, and then they know that, okay, now I need to subscribe to the live event log starting from uh, entry number three. So in that way, they can kind of really quickly get up to date. Because in this example, Homer was in the list for a while, but isn't anymore. That's not necessary to know from the UI state's point of view. That's just kind of redundant data that can be discarded. You don't need to know that, so you can replay just based on the snapshot that is kind of a condensed version of the data. What you also might want to do eventually, same as in any event sourcing architecture, is to truncate this event log. When you know that you have kind of a good snapshot from index 5000, then you can throw away the old messages because otherwise you will fill up lots of disk space in the long run and so on. Final thing in the cluster with the latency, uh, you need to think about kind of how do we wait for confirmation in different things. In multiplayer games, this is usually referred to as latency compensation. Basically, how, how do you how do you make things work in a sensible way when you're not certain which things happened first until after a while? So who shot first kind of thing. This depends on the use case. So with the presence use case, for instance, or also notifications, 
it doesn't matter the exact ordering. Either you're present or then you're not. It doesn't matter if you or you joined first. Uh, with locking, we got the opposite. There you always need to wait. So in the UI, typically when you click the lock, some button that gets a lock, you show a spinner or something until you get confirmation that yes, now the lock is actually uh, acquired. And then, then when you get that confirmation, then you remove the spinner and actually go on to do whatever you were so supposed to do with that lock. The really interesting part comes in the two final use cases. So with messaging and with editing a draft together. Because there, well, let, let's take an example. So a really simple shared form that we're editing. Everyone gets to choose their favorite uh, letter. And like you one might guess, Marge chooses M and Homer chooses H. And when this is sent to the synchronizer, what happens is that, of course, one of the messages is received first, and then both parties get an update that, hey, now the value is M. For Marge, this is confirmation. Yes, of course, I clicked M, and now M is selected. But from Homer's point of view, here we have kind of a conflict. If we were just kind of immediately when we receive this message, update the UI, then it would flicker back and forth for Homer and that wouldn't be nice. So instead what we can do on a UI level is to see, oh, wait, we got a conflict. I'm quite certain that I will really soon get an update saying that, hey, value is H. So let's just wait with any updates. Ignore all updates until we get confirmation, was my message also processed or not, and where did it end up in the order and so on. So in that way, moments later, when the synchronizer also has processed the message from Homer, then yes, for Marge, it flickers a little bit. She clicked M and moments later, H was, was actually selected. Maybe a little bit confusing, but still fine. But then for Homer, we avoid kind of flickering many times back and forth by just ignoring updates when we have a pending conflict and waiting until we get get confirmation on, on that thing. So that's clustering. You do clustering not because you made your uh, application collaborative multiplayer, but if you use clustering for other reasons, then a couple of things to keep in mind. One is don't build your own distributed system because you will fail. I mean, it's difficult, uh, but use something existing like, for instance, again, Kafka or, or InfiniSpan or all of those. That gives you the same strong consistency of event ordering that you also had in the in-memory simple case. Use snapshots to deal with event log growing longer and longer and longer. Same synthetic events that you always had. And then depending on the use case, Sometimes you get optimistic locking, sometimes pessimistic locking to make sure that kind of things make sense also in the UI layer, not only kind of keeping the data synchronized. And that's really it. So again, to summarize, you want to build really cool enterprise multiplayer applications because that's good for productivity. That's good with people being able to work together even though they are in different offices or working from home or or, or whatnot. We got a couple of basic building blocks on the UI level. We got presence, we got messaging, we got locking, we got notifications, we got editing things together. And combining those in different ways lets you do almost anything you might want to do in a business application context. On architectural level, we got data, shared UI state in topics, each topic is isolated from the other topics to, to avoid contention with updates. You got JSON data there, just kind of dumb data. The UI layer interprets that data to update uh, things on the screen. You got event sourcing principles there with uh, events going into a log, subscribing with synthetic events to avoid the, the ordering issue. If you go cluster, then use existing technology for the synchronizing do snapshots to avoid the event log growing too long and be smart about the latency compensation for the sake of the users. Thank you.
we got good time for questions, and then also I got colleagues there handing out Vardin socks for anyone who wants those. <laughs> but questions first, don't, don't rush there. Either everything was really, really crystal clear. No, actually, we got a question. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we, you had this uh, where you had a collaborative editing. Yep. Uh, and then you had the uh, preview button before producing the... Uh, yep. Can you go back to, to that? I will go back to that. Yeah, actually, let's. Uh, and then, then someone edits. Yep. And, and then I'm back to square one. You, 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 you're back to square one in case multiple persons preview at the same time and then they save in opposite order to how they open the preview. Yeah. So, what you might want to do there is to have locking only in this phase, maybe with a timeout or something, so that when what. Uh, when so when one person opens the preview, then I disable. Yeah, exactly. That that's one way of dealing with it. Uh, but again, it's yeah. So the conflict can still happen, but now we have made it much less likely. Because also, one thing to always always remember here is that we got humans who want to work together. Usually, I mean, it didn't fit on this screen, but we could have a chat here also. We could have all these kinds of things so that probably they kind of talk with each other and say that is everything done now and then kind of one said, okay, well then I will do the submitting. But even if they wouldn't, then yes, a little bit extra on top of this, then you can make it also avoid this kind of preview on preview conflict. Yeah, it's not even just that, because you might also have a big form. You might have scrolled out of view some things that someone else started editing. You didn't even realize that they have been doing those changes. So, oh, yeah. so, so you kind of, you, you definitely need to, it, it's again, this is for the sake of the user so that they can, I mean, this is also, one question I sometimes get is, we do a financial application and it's really important to have kind of accountability who has changed what. So there you got two different alternatives. Uh, this is kind of related because either you have so that whoever actually does the save owns all the changes or then you can also kind of track who was the last person to touch each field and then do the accountability based on that. And that also relates to kind of what actually happens when I save or when I open the preview and so on. I think I get it, uh, and it's it's uh, the problem becomes harder when you have a form that's bigger than this. Yes, like when you said scrolling, and and you have yep. several things at the same time. Yeah, of course, that's that's much more complicated. Yeah. So so then you don't only have the latency that might cause problems, but also just kind of others not even noticing what happens. All right. Anything else, or is it? Yep. What sizes of socks do you have? Uh, we got two different sizes. Uh, we've got two different sizes of socks, uh, S, M, and then L, and, uh, and above. <laughs> but yeah, e excellent question. <laughs> Anything else, or should we just get, get to the important business? <laughs> All right, well, off you go. Thank you. Thank you.